in our second day, uh, and we have today uh, Professor Talia Fischer, who is Professor of Human Rights at Tel Aviv University, where she teaches and researches in uh, uh, negotiation theory, evidence law, and ADR. And today she will talk about evidence law theory and the threshold model. Yes. Okay, so good morning. Hi, everyone. Um, at the outset, I'd like to thank Diego and Victor for inviting me to participate in the workshop and for the wonderful hospitality. Thank you very, very much. Um, and I'd like to talk about one corpus of my thinking and writing um, about evidence law theory, which revolves around the challenging of the beyond a reasonable doubt threshold model. Uh, with its derivative all-or-nothing conceptualization of criminal guilt and punishment. So in a previous workshop in uh, Girona in the summer, I highlighted some of the prospects entailed in transitioning to an alternative decision-making model of probabilistic sentencing, um, which supports a plurality of conviction categories along the evidentiary spectrum, such as conviction on, beyond, on guilt beyond reasonable doubt, conviction um, on guilt by clear and convincing evidence, convic conviction on guilt beyond any re residual doubt, perhaps even uh, by preponderance of the evidence, with associated degrees of punishment. Uh, in the context of the trial, of the criminal trial, I discussed uh, probabilistic sentencing, namely a decision uh, regime in which punishment is calibrated with certainty of guilt. Um, in the context of plea bargaining, I discussed or examined the possible widening of the scope of the negotiable features of trial, so as to include the standard of proof, namely to allow the defense and prosecution to engage in plea bargains aimed at deviation from the beyond a reasonable doubt standard of proof to a lower uh, evidentiary threshold, say preponderance of the evidence, as a prerequisite for conviction in return for partial concessions um, in sentencing in the event of conviction. And using these examples in the summer, I tried to demonstrate how a more compartmentalized uh, conceptualization of conviction and punishment could allow, under certain circumstances, for a better realization of the goals underlying uh, criminal trials, especially deterrence. Today, I'd like to introduce yet another evidentiary mechanism made possible if we desert the all or nothing uh, penal regime associated with the threshold model um, in, in favor of, of a decision regime that is supporting a multiplicity of conviction categories with matching degrees of punishment. But first, before I delve into that, for those who weren't in this, uh, par participants in the summer conference, uh, just a few words about uh, the threshold model and the issues at hand. So under the prevailing uh, evidentiary threshold model, guilt and the finding of guilt are conceptualized in a binary manner and as purely categorical phenomena. At the end of trial, the defendant is pronounced either guilty or not guilty of the charges made against her, excluding the possibility of judgment of degree. Judges or juries can't calibrate findings of guilt to various degrees of certainty, nor can decision makers qualify the verdict to reflect normative or legal ambiguities. Findings of guilt are construed as asserting factual and legal truth. The penal results of conviction assume similarly binary all or nothing properties. Punishment can be calibrated, but not with established probabilities of guilt. So it could be other circumstances which mitigate sentencing, but it's not um, probability of guilt, whether from a normative or a factual perspective. In contrast, in the ancient judicial world, supposedly, criminal guilt was uh, it assumed a more linear um, or continuous structure. So in the words of Michel Foucault, uh, this was a principle of continuous gradation, and I'm quoting, in his words, guilt did not begin when all evidence was gathered together piece by piece. It was constituted by each of the elements that made it possible to recognize a guilty person. Thus, a semi-proof did not leave the suspect innocent until such time as it was completed. It made him semi-guilty. Slight evidence of a serious crime marked someone as slightly criminal. 
In short, penal demonstration did not obey a dualistic system, true or false, but a principle of continuous gradation, a degree reached in the demonstration already formed a degree of guilt and <coughs> consequently involved a degree of punishment, end of quote. So in, in my previous talk, I offered the economic case for such calibration of punishment with certainty of guilt. Um, and it referred both to the evidentiary space above the beyond a reasonable doubt threshold where um, conviction beyond any residual doubt would yield uh, a graver punishment than conviction beyond a reasonable doubt but with lingering residual doubt um, for the same offense, of course, and under the same circumstances. It also re referred to the imposition of partial punishment in the evidentiary space under the beyond a reasonable doubt threshold in cases especially of systematic failures of proof. Um, and using the tools of economic analysis, I demonstrated that in cases where the criminal sanction generates a social cost that is a function of its severity, namely all incarcerable offenses, right, where, where the social cost of the punishment is um, in, in line with its severity, probabilistic sentencing facilitates a higher level of deterrence compared to the threshold model for any given level of social expenditure and punishment. Correlating severity of sanction with the probability of guilt I showed leads to better outcomes, especially in cases of systematic failures of proof. And in this sense, the issue of probabilistic decision making in the criminal, criminal arena can be understood as an offshoot of the tort law debate, to those of you familiar with it, uh, over causal allocation of liability, um, you know, market share liability doctrines uh, like that. Um, beyond the normative um, essentially the Terence based case that I made for the threshold model, and I'd be happy to expand on this as well, it's just uh, in the Q&A, but I won't delve into it deeply at this point. But beyond the normative deterrence based case, um, I tried to show that the threshold model can also be challenged on descriptive grounds, at least if you think about it in, in the two-tier system that David spoke about yesterday in terms of um, how the individual judges are to uh, operate uh, irrespective of the design of the system. Um, there is room to claim that um, at this level, probabilistic decision-making in criminal law is it's not just part of some distant past in Romano canon law, um, but that upon closer scrutiny, we can actually see um, the logic of probabilistic sentencing in central prevailing doctrines in criminal law. So a few examples, one, one uh, very explicit example in American law is the doctrine of uh, residual doubt in the American legal system. Um, so uh, as you may all well know, um, usually in the American system, juries, uh, they convict or acquit and the judges uh, sentence. But when it comes to capital sentencing, um, the allocation of decision making is different and juries also sentence. Um, and according to um, uh, the doctrine of residual doubt, uh, juries at, at some state uh, levels and also at the federal level, uh, juries can decide not to impose a death sentence due to remaining but unreasonable doubt as to the defendant's guilt. So it's beyond, they, they convict because they were convinced beyond a reasonable doubt but still have lingering residual doubt and this can translate into a mitigation of the sentence from a death penalty to life sentence. Um, so this doctrine effectively creates two categories of conviction, uh, conviction beyond a reasonable doubt and conviction beyond uh, residual doubt with two corresponding degrees of punishment, uh, life imprisonment and capital sentencing respectively. Uh, another example in my opinion of how probabilistic logic infiltrates uh, criminal proceedings is the recidivism sentencing premium. So I understood from t yesterday's discussion, I was not aware of this, that in Spain, um, you know, past convictions can be admitted during um, the conviction phase of trial, but this is not what happens in the Anglo-American world. In the Anglo-American world, typically, um, the judges are exposed to this information only at sentencing. So now, um, um, all systems of law that I know, right, um, they, they uh, have a premium for recidivism, right? There's a harsher sentencing for recidivism. There are a lot of uh, deterrence-based, you know, a lot of utilitarian and deontological explanations for this um, 
for this recidivism sentencing premium, um, and, and I'm not refuting the, these uh, rationales, but alongside them, I think we can understand uh, this re recidivist premium in terms of probabilistic sentencing. So um, again, in the Anglo-American world, the typical case would be that uh, the judges would receive um, evidence and decide to convict beyond a reasonable doubt. And after they have convicted, they are um, presented with evidence suggesting that this defendant had already committed this offense seven times in the past. This updates the level of certainty as to the current conviction. And I think that the delta in the punishment can be uh, understood as reflecting a higher degree of certainty. Um, so I think, again, it not, it not to say that the utilitarian or the ontological considerations that are um, you know, familiar in, in the literature uh, don't stand as well, but alongside them, I think we can understand this as reflecting uh, parallelistic sentencing. Yet another example is the jury trial penalty. Um, this is the name for a, a large family of um, uh, cases in which um, harsher sentences are imposed on, on convicted defendants who chose to assert their procedural and evidentiary rights. So it's called the jury trial penalty because it has been found that in the United States, those who assert the right to be tried before a jury are typically, um, typically receive higher sentences upon conviction than those who opt for bench trials and waive their right to jury trial. Um, it is why we don't have juries, but you know, it's, it, um, there are a lot of circumstances. It's, it's conceptualized in a diff in sort of the reverse manner. Um, if you waive your procedural and evidentiary safeguards, you're, giving, you're given a sentencing <coughs> concession for not um, you know, using up court time or not um, making the administration of criminal justice more costly. Uh, so if you, do, if you don't waive or you do assert your rights, there is a, 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 an additional punishment in a way. Um, and uh, again, this can be understood in terms of incentivizing uh, you know, defendants not to assert their evidentiary rights um, and not to, not to abuse their rights um, and, and to uh, uh, impose extra costs on the administration of criminal justice. But alongside this, we can also understand it as a form of probabilistic sentencing. We can say that when one is convicted after 12 jurors have been convinced beyond a reasonable doubt, the degree of certainty as to their uh, uh, involvement um, in, in the case is higher than if it's just um, one, one judge. Or um, that if one is convicted after asserting all their evidentiary and procedural rights, we are more convinced of their, uh, of their guilt than if they waive their right to silence or their right to counsel, etc. cetera. Um, and these are all cases in the, in the um, space above the beyond reasonable doubt uh, threshold, but um, we can also think of probabilistic <coughs> sentencing under this threshold. Think of, of course, plea bargaining, right? So plea bargaining, I think, is yet another arena of probabilistic sentencing um, because plea bargains effectively calibrate sentences to the probative value of the incriminating evidence. Now, obviously, this view of plea bargaining, it demands um, or it um, requires a skeptical leap with respect to the probative weight of the confession, of the in-court confession. But I think... Um, in terms of uh, uh, the reality, um, I think that it, we can look at it as an instance of partial guilt being translated into partial sentencing. Um, because what each of the parties to the negotiation table come with is essentially, you know, the, the, uh, what the prosecution comes with is the probative weight of the case. Um, so this is, this is what uh, I, I discussed uh, before. This is just a background. Now I'd like to delve into what I'd talk about today. Um, and to further extend sort of the <coughs> evidentiary imagination by proposing another venue that's made possible through deviation from the all or nothing configuration of, of conviction and punishment. Um, and this model 
is uh, uh, reverberates a lot of the things that Rinach talked about yesterday. Uh, it's in the arena of confessions, and it's um, premised on joint writing with uh, another colleague of mine, Isi Rosensvi, from our faculty. Um, and and like the other two manifestations that I mentioned, parallelistic sentencing and also um, the widening of the plea bargaining arena, um, it manifests another, um, I think, possibility. Uh, if, if we endorse a multiplicity of conviction categories, but this is from a very different angle, it refers to the type of evidence being submitted at trial. Um, and, and it relates to the use of penal concessions as a means of disin disincentivizing uh, over -resor resort to problematic evidence such as out-of-court confessions. So, uh, as Renat said, I won't uh, uh, delve into it deeply because Renat really gave a very nice talk yesterday, but out-of-court confessions, they play a paramount role in the criminal justice system, in the world of evidence law scholarship. Uh, there are numerous empirical studies which have established a strong causal connection between police interrogation, false confessions, and wrongful convictions. Um, um, this has been especially substantiated in the DNA exoneration era, uh, the Innocence Project in the United States. Um, I think uh, contemporary studies that I've seen estimate that between 25 to 30 percent of um, wrongly convicted individuals who have been exonerated in the DNA Innocence Project um, have uh, been convicted as uh, a result of out-of-court confessions, some of them corroborated. Um, the causes of false confessions are divided uh, in the literature uh, to external and internal uh, causes. So the external causes are primarily measures inflicted by the interrogating officers, um, and the internal causes are irrespective of, of how the interrogators behave. So it could be my wanting to um, protect a family member or you know, protect someone else in the gang or, or something like, of that nature. And the legal doctrine is accordingly divided into the voluntariness rules, such as uh, the Miranda ruling in the United States, um, or uh, free will, etc., in our legal system. Um, and they are designed to protect against the external pressures um, by the interrogating officers. And corroboration rules, such as the corpus <coughs> delicti and the trustworthiness doctrine, uh, aimed at the internal causes. Uh, but despite legislative and um, judicial initiatives, studies have shown the persistence of the problem of false, conf uh, false confessions. Um, and many attempts have been made, including by scholars around this table. So Boaz is uh, one of the um, most well-known ones in this, in this uh, regard, um, to solve the problem of confession-based wrongful convictions. And these include enhanced voluntariness requirements, as well as stricter corroboration rules, um, even to the point uh, of turning the out-of-court confession to the corroborating piece of evidence, which is uh, what uh, was suggested. And they all, the, the, these proposals are, are all wonderful, and they, but they all share one notable common feature, and that is the resort to evidentiary means to solve this evidentiary problem. And what we tried to do was to think um, of a different type of means to solve the problem, resorting to penal means to solve the evidentiary problem. So it's not, it doesn't replace these um, initiatives, but it's alongside them. Um, in order to explain our model, uh, how many minutes do I have? Um, About 25. 25, yeah, okay. So in order to explain the model, so I'll just go back quickly to the, to the uh, factors leading to uh, wrongful convictions. So, as I said, um, the literature and also the legal doctrine, they view it from external and internal, uh, divide uh, to external and internal reasons. We think about it in, a slightly, in slightly different terms. Uh, we, just, we divide um, the problem to the pretrial phase and to the trial phase. At the pretrial phase, we think that the problem of, fa of false confessions derives from the fact that police officials and prosecutors, we think about them together for this uh, model, um, they lack incentives to exercise sufficient measures to ensure that the conviction that they elicit is a, is a, truthful, is a truthful one. 
Uh, so although as a general rule, we think that, or we hope, that law enforcers do not elicit false confessions knowingly or intentionally, um, we fear that they neglect, or they may neglect, or may be incentivized to neglect to take the necessary precautions to avoid um, false convictions, to ensure that the, convictions, uh, that the confessions are, are true. Um, this results from the current reality in which law enforcement officers internalize the benefits associated um, with confessions, uh, but externalize the, the social costs involved, including the stagnation of the system um, as a whole. Um, uh, and, and, and as I said, it's true not only with respect to the police officers, but also to the prosecution. The fact that confessions lead to virtually assured convictions, and this is a quote, blinds some prosecutors to their ethical obligation to pursue truth and seek justice, so much so that confessions have been termed the golden ring for which prosecutors always reach. And we have interviewed um, prosecutors in Israel who, who view confession as the golden ring and who think um, that when once th there's a confession alongside some very, very slight, light as a feather, as Dwa says, um, corroborative evidence, uh, it's, it's the successful end of the interrogation for them. Um, but the problem, problematic incentive structure to which law enforcers are subject, it doesn't constitute the entire problem, right? Because if uh, judges were to operate as effective gatekeepers, right, um, then c such confessions would not lead to false convictions. But the problem is um, that judges and juries fail in their role as gatekeepers, and this is because in our opinion, um, they don't have a good separating mechanism. They don't get enough signaling, and I'll, and I'll explain. Um, but, but I'll just say that the, the, the failure here has been confirmed in numerous empirical, experimental, and field studies. And they all show the judges tend to um, overestimate the probative value of confessions and fail to distinguish between truthful and false ones. Um, and, and this high credibility attributed by judges because of their bad gatekeeping to out-of-court confessions strengthens the faulty incentive structure of the police and prosecution, um, and so on and so forth. So in other words, um, the prevailing evidentiary regime creates a vicious cycle. The police and prosecution both have a strong incentive to elicit confessions um, and not enough incentives to seek extrinsic supporting evidence due to the fact that they internalize the benefits of conf confessions while externalizing social costs. Because the likelihood of confession, of conviction based upon confession is extremely high in conditions of budgetary constraints, etc., pursuing additional extrinsic evidence beyond the minimal corroborative requirements becomes unreasonable from the point of view of police and prosecution. So the minimum evidentiary standard becomes de facto the maximum requirement. Um, judges and jurors faced with cases founded exclusively on confessions are generally unable to distinguish or, or to resolve whether they could have been corroborated by extrinsic evidence had the police searched for it, right? They assume they routinely, they routinely make the implicit assumption that had the police interrogators been incentivized to search for extrinsic evidence and search for extrinsic they would have found it. Uh, but the reason that they didn't find it is because they were incentivized to move on to the next uh, case. Um, and therefore, they tend to convict based upon such um, uh, evidentiary profile of the case. This, of course, reinforces the strong incentive of the police and prosecution to focus exclusively on confessions and to forego any attempts to look for extrinsic evidence. Um, and the system spirals down in an endless pattern, leading to the high rate of false confessions and wrongful convictions. And, and if you look at the um, probability of conviction, um, it's, it's identical in the, when it's the minimal and uh, the maximum. Now, the, the structure that we just um, 
that I just presented here, I think corresponds nicely to the legal doctrine. Uh, just as the uh, external-internal uh, dichotomy corresponds with the doctrine, I think ours also corresponds, because we could say um, that the legal, that the voluntariness requirements are aimed at dealing with the faulty incentive structure of police interrogators, um, and that the corroboration requirements, uh, they, they are uh, meant to deal with a deficient gate, gatekeeping on behalf of the court, right? It's, we can understand. So I think, I think this is uh, another possible way to, to explain the problem. Um, and as I said, the attempts to correct the problem through, um, up to date have been through evidentiary means, but we think that they didn't suffice. Um, what we propose is to correct this vicious cycle by increasing the cost of confessions relative to other types of evidence by imposing what we call a penalty on the state prosecution in the form of mandatory reduction in sentencing if um, out-of-court confessions are introduced as evidence at trial. Okay? So for instance, let's say um, under the sentencing guidelines, okay, um, uh, the sentence for robbery is seven years in prison. Um, if the prosecution to prove this case introduces an out-of-court confession, upon conviction, the judge would have to subtract, I don't know, X from seven years. Okay, this is what we call the confessional penalty. Um, placing such a sentencing price tag on the use of confessions would alter, in our opinion, the entire incentive structure within the criminal justice system. It would correct the current bias in favor of using confessions by making law enforcement internalize the social cost of confessions and thus induce them to find extrinsic evidence. In response, it will then pr provide the court with a sorting mechanism um, and would turn judges and just jurors into more forceful gatekeepers that can prevent false confessions from tainting the verdict. So I'll, I'll just explain it very, very briefly. Um, the assumption here is that the prosecution is interesting not only in convictions, but in maximizing the expected punishment imposed upon whom they believe are guilty defendants. And this is a very plausible assumption because, at least in Israel, um, the conviction rates are so high. And when we spoke, spoke to prosecutors, they said the only game in town is the punishment, is the sentencing. Because, you know, achieving and uh, obtaining a conviction is almost uh, the baseline. So the whole game is if you're successful or not, is, you know, um, after plea bargaining or after resorting to trial, what was the <coughs> sentence? So they're interested as a general rule in maximizing not just conviction rates, but the expected punishment. So under these um, circumstances, I think uh, the, our hope is that the punishment price tag would alter the prosecution's incentive structure. As opposed to the current state of affairs, law enforcement uh, officials would pay a significant price for using confessions in the form of reduced sentencing. And, th and since this penalty could only be avoided by introducing and providing extrinsic evidence um, sufficient to convict without resorting to the out-of-court confession, the prosecution would direct the police to gather such evidence even after a confession has been obtained. And perhaps the confession would lead to this extrinsic evidence, right? The, uh, the, the, the defendant, the suspect would say, I buried the gun under this tree. And you know, they would look, come, go looking for the gun. As a result, instead of being the prosecution's centerpiece, confessions would be relegated a residual role to be used when the police are unable to unearth enough extrinsic evidence to secure a conviction without resorting to the out-of-court confession and, and introducing it in court. As a result of this shift of incentive, um, the punishment price, price tag would serve as a signal signaling or sorting mechanism for judges and jurors. So th there can be a few possible um, you know, factual uh, uh, cases here, right? So one case would be um, the police would obtain 
um, an out-of-court confession which would lead to enough extrinsic evidence to secure conviction without having to introduce the out-of-court confession, they would uh, introduce this extrinsic evidence and receive full sentence upon conviction. Another possibility is that um, they won't find enough extrinsic evidence, and then they would have to uh, introduce the out-of-court confession uh, in addition to the extrinsic evidence that they found. But in this case, in this case, by, 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 by introducing the out-of-court confession, they would uh, have to uh, absorb the confessional penalty upon conviction. Um, but th there would be a stronger signaling mechanism with respect to the reliability of the out-of-court confession because now the judge or or jurors, they would be able to um, understand how much supporting extrinsic evidence there is to the out-of-court confession and ascribe the probative weight accordingly. So if the police couldn't uncover any extrinsic evidence beyond the minimal corroborative requirements, not only would conviction lead to imposition of a reduced sentence, but the probability of conviction would also be lower because this would be a, a signal that perhaps this out-of-court confession is unreliable because there's very little or none supporting extrinsic evidence. Under other circumstances, there could be more uh, extrinsic evidence which would support the reliability of the out-of-court confession, but not enough so, so as to make it uh, 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 totally abundant. And then there would be um, a reduced sentence, but still a higher probability of sentencing uh, of conviction vis-a-vis -vis, um, the possibility of very, very little or, or none extrinsic evidence, right? So, so uh, under this regime, um, the prosecution would be induced to introduce whatever extrinsic evidence that it uncovered, and the degree or the, the probative weight of this extrinsic evidence would also translate into the, uh, to the weight ascribed to the out-of-court confession when it is introduced into trial. Um, therefore, what we see here is a, a, another type of cycle, right? Because um, the uh, uh, under this uh, under our model, um, the court knows that the prosecution and the police are incentivized to look for extrinsic evidence. Therefore, if what they see in terms of the evidentiary profile of the case is um, the minimal you know, out-of-court confession and corroborative uh, um, evidence, the probability of guilt diminishes, uh, of, of, I'm sorry, the probability of conviction diminishes. Um, and so this is a, 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 it creates another cycle, right, um, which, incentivizes police and prosecution to search for out-of-court, um, for extrinsic evidence, um, and thereby facilitates the signaling mechanism. So it's, it's another spiral, but in the other direction. Now, there are um, a few points that I'd like to highlight here. So there was, uh, under the prevailing vicious cycle, there is a pooling problem in the sense that when, um, the judges see a case in which there's out-of-court confession and the minimal corroborative requirements exclusively, right? They think of cases in which the police didn't have enough incentive to look for extrinsic evidence, and cases in which they looked and didn't find, they think of them together, and they tend to convict under both circumstances, right? Our model creates Another pooling problem, right? Because under our model, uh, there could be circumstances whereby the, in, in order to secure a higher punishment, right, to, to, to save the um, confessional penalty reduction, police would have to resort to um, uh, great, uh, you know, make great attempts to find extrinsic evidence and Sometimes it wouldn't be, you know, in a cost-benefit uh, analysis, it, it, it wouldn't be beneficial to do so. And these cases would be viewed under our model 
uh, together with or pooled together with cases in which they looked and couldn't find, and this could lead to a reduction um, in the uh, expected punishment. So, there's a, so we have sort of a mirror image pooling problem, but um, I think that here I'd like to make uh, uh, two points. One is that our pooling problem leads to a higher rate of acquittals. You know, whereas the prevailing vicious cycle um, pooling problem leads to a higher rate of false convictions. And of course, um, you know, in, in the criminal justice system, we prefer false acquittals to false um, convictions. So that's one point. The other is that, you know, we can calibrate the um, uh, extent of the sentencing reduction or the sentencing penalty to different types or categories of cases in this matter. So if um, we're talking about intent offenses, which are very hard to uh, uh, you know, prove by resorting to extrinsic evidence, then we could make a, a, re a smaller reduction than you know, in like messy crimes where one would expect uh, to find extrinsic evidence. So we can calibrate this. Um, to a certain extent. So this is uh, one point. Another point I'd like to make is that our proposed mechanism it's, is not designed to prevent or discourage the police from eliciting confessions. We think that confessions uh, are a valuable investigative tool and that they can lead to reliable extrinsic evidence. Uh, the mandatory reduction of punishment is only, only applies with, re with uh, respect to re introduction of the confessions in court, um, not to the very obtaining of them. Um, so there's much more to say about this uh, mechanism, which is far from being uh, intuitive, and it requires a certain degree of conceptual flexibility, especially if you're a tributivist. Um, it can naturally be contested on various normative grounds, and I'll, I'll be happy to go and delve into it in, in the Q&A. Um, I'll just say that this serves as yet another instance of the potential associated with creation of different types of conviction categories, this time based on the underlying type of evidence. So we can have conviction based on out-of-court confession resulting in reduced punishment and conviction based on extrinsic evidence leading to full-fledged punishment, right? So, so the type of evidence brought to trial uh, is translated into a conviction category uh, and I'll conclude by saying that the question of criminal culpability pertains to the most complex categories uh, dealt with by law. Uh, and attempting to force its resolution into binary on-off categories based on clear-cut borderline between guilt and innocence, I think it streams, stream rolls the complexity of the issues at hand. It dictates the reduction of a wide variety of variables, and they could be factual, evidentiary, or legal, or moral, uh, into very thin one-dimensional groupings um, transforming criminal culpability and the resulting punishment from an on-off, all-or-nothing phenomena to a plurality of conviction categories, to degrees of punishment, um, transforming it from qualitative questions of yes or no to quantitative questions of how much could allow, perhaps, for the refinement of the institution of criminal verdicts and pave way for a more successful attainment of the goals underlying the criminal justice system. Thank you.